Okay, folks, welcome to another session of PHI331. Uh, I hope everybody's doing well out there, uh, in spite of all the craziness that there is in the world right now. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about a paper by Jeremy Waldron called uh, Superseding Historical Injustice. So, uh, let's uh, get to it and... Uh, figure out uh, what Waldron has to say and uh, how it adds something uh, to the discussion about reparations that we started earlier this week. So Waldron is a philosopher from New Zealand. Uh, he currently teaches in the law program at NYU, uh, but he's taught at a number of uh, well-regarded schools. And Waldron is uh, a big name when it comes to thinking about uh, justice and uh, social political philosophy in general. Uh, just to give a quick sampling of some of his other works. Uh, he wrote a book called The Right to Private Property, uh, has a collection of papers about liberal rights. You know, liberal rights here uh, is often going to be connected to uh, theories of justice related to the social contract tradition, so dating back to people like Hobbes, Locke, and then more recently, uh, people like uh, Rawls. Uh, in 2010, he put out a book called Torture, Terror, and Trade-Offs, Philosophy for the White House, uh, and in 2017, had a book called One Another's Equals, The Basis of Human Equality. Uh, so Waldron has wide-ranging thoughts and has a lot of things to say about justice. So today we're going to be thinking about justice as it relates to uh, injustices done towards uh, indigenous peoples, uh, especially relating to uh, historical instances of you know, colonialism and genocide. So the key example that we're going to be looking at in Waldron's paper, the one that really animates his thinking, is one that is local to him. So he's thinking about uh, abor Aboriginal populations in Australia and New Zealand uh, that were uh, displaced and uh, defrauded of their lands uh, by white settlers in the 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, so one of the things that Waldron points out right at the outset in this paper is that our concept of justice is forward-looking. So when we say that a concept of justice is forward-looking, what we're saying is that it tells us about the future, how we are going to act towards others. Uh, another way of thinking about this is that it gives us prescriptions for acting in certain ways. Uh, so that's the main uh, idea that Waldron has, is that our normative concepts are action-guiding. But he also acknowledges that when we think about justice, uh, we also think about it with respect to the past. So he says that when we make a moral judgment about something, uh, we place a particular act into a category, and when we see it as wrong, we think that X's of this type have the property of wrongness. Uh, and when we think about it in that way, uh, not only is it going to give us forward-looking advice, it's also going to give us advice about how to deal with the after-effects of injustice in the past. Uh, and moreover, he points out that the way we think about justice and injustice in the past is often going to have an effect on one's identity. So we can certainly recognize the way that certain... Uh, cultural groups uh, might understand themselves uh, by thinking about injustices that were done to them in the past. Uh, so, you know, we might think about an American identity as uh, connected to uh, injustices uh, done to settlers by uh, English rule. Uh, or um, indigenous persons uh, might understand their identity in terms of understanding that they were unjustly treated uh, by colonial settlers. 
Uh, so even though Waldron sees justice as a mainly forward-looking concept, it also uh, does guide our thinking when we think about the past as well. So it does have uh, maybe a less predominant but still uh, present uh, backward-looking element. So Waldron does look at an expressive function of reparations, that it is a way of acknowledging a wrong. Uh, but what Waldron is really interested in in this paper is reparative justice. Uh, justice that restores the world to the way that it would be if the justice had never occurred. So he soon says that this kind of counterfactual reasoning uh, is central to our thinking about reparations. So when we answer the question of what is a correct reparation, what is the correct amount of reparation, he says we want to think about how goods would be distributed if the original injustice had not occurred. So we call this a counterfactual. A counterfactual claim is just a claim about how things would be if a thing that did not in fact happen had happened. Uh, so an example of a counterfactual would be a claim like, if Kennedy had not been assassinated, he would have been reelected in 1964. So we're saying, how would things be if something that did happen hadn't happened, right? So what Waldron wants us to think about for the counterfactual when we think about reparations is how would goods, monies, lands be distributed if the original injustice, say, settlement of lands, seizure of lands by colonialists, had not occurred? Uh, so what Waldron points out here is that this line of thought is going to force us to make predictions about how goods would be arranged. Uh, but he says that this is extremely hard to do uh, when free choices are a factor. The thought here is, is that if, for instance, a person had not had their money stolen a year ago, uh, there's no saying that that money would still be in their pocket today. Right? There's no saying that they would have blown that money gambling the next day, is Waldron's thought. So it's hard to know uh, what would satisfy these counterfactuals, what uh, amount of resources a person would have if the original injustice, like an unjust seizure of land, did not occur. And what Waldron says is it's not clear that our best prediction of someone's behavior is going to carry any moral weight. Uh, so for instance, uh, our best prediction of uh, what a person will do uh, is not always going to take the day. So if you consider, say, a hypothetical aunt who has long been an advocate for the charity Amnesty International, and you think she's going to donate uh, her uh, remaining resources when she dies to Amnesty International. If it turns out that a week before she dies, she learns about a local charity that's there to look after dogs, uh, is named as the benefactor in her will, then that's going to carry the day, even if the better prediction is that she's going to give the money to Amnesty International. Uh, so predictions of behavior don't carry uh, normative weight. Uh, Waldron also points out that maybe in some cases, uh, predictions do carry weight. Uh, so for instance, if it's your job to be a trustee of your aunt's stocks while she is away on vacation, uh, then you should do that trusteeship work on the basis of predicting uh, what she would have rationally chosen. Uh, but Waldron says, uh, it's not clear uh, what people uh, actually would do with their resources. Uh, he even says 
when it comes to free choices, there aren't there isn't really a fact of the matter in the case. So, uh, if there's no fact of the matter about how goods would be distributed if the original injustice hadn't occurred, because it's uh, a situation where free choices are a factor, uh, then we can't appeal to this kind of reasoning, at least. Or, uh, it's hard to know, and moreover, uh, our best predictions of behavior uh, do not seem to be uh, morally decisive according to Waldron. But moreover, he points out that uh, certain entitlements are going to fade over time. So his thought here might be, look, if you have an injustice done to you uh, in that very moment, uh, you might be entitled to reparation. But uh, the longer it takes uh, after that original injustice, uh, the less of a claim you have uh, to seek reparation. So Waldron points out, we've got a quote here, he says, it's widely believed that some rights are capable of fading in their moral importance by virtue of the passage of time and by the sheer persistence of what was origi originally a wrongful infringement. Uh, so he gives the example of a stolen car and then that stolen car is passed down to the thief's children, and then the thief's grandchildren, and it becomes a special family heirloom. Waldron asks, does the discovery of theft mean that it has to be given back uh, to the original owner, you know, the one who was stolen from two generations ago? And Waldron says, at least if you think that certain moral entitlements can fade over time, we might think that the grandchildren might have at least some claim to retain ownership of the stolen car. Uh, so one thing that Waldron points out is that there are pragmatic reasons uh, for letting certain rights fade. Uh, so for instance, a right to take somebody to court for a certain infraction. Uh, we have statutes of limitations which say you cannot press charges on an assault. 25 years after the fact, uh, and there are important procedural rationales uh, for these things. Uh, it's just hard to gather evidence or a defense or evidence in favor uh, after a certain amount of time has passed. Uh, but Waldron says it's not just about pragmatic issues related to it's being hard to know the facts of the matter about a certain injustice. He also points out that there are non-pragmatic reasons. So he says that property rights are closely connected to usage and circumstances. Uh, so just to get a little deeper into property rights, Waldron points out uh, that he doesn't think that Locke's theory of appropriation of goods, that is, making things that aren't anybody's property into your property. He thinks that this is a bad basis for a theory of property and property rights. So for one thing, he points out that it doesn't make sense to say that your labor can be mixed with a good forever. So if you till a piece of land in the commons, uh, according to Locke's theory, uh, that would be your property because your labor uh, would always be mixed with that land. Uh, but he also claims that Locke's theory is incoherent. So if something has made your property by mixing your labor with it, uh, it doesn't give us a very good account of how transfers of property, say giving your property an inheritance to your children, uh, is to be made sense of, nor gifts. Because uh, if uh, giving someone, if making something your property is basically mixing your labor with it, uh, you own yourself, so therefore you own the things uh, that you mix your labor with, uh, it would seem that transfers and gifts would be something like giving a part of yourself uh, to another person, but that seems incoherent, uh, especially along with this view that uh, your labor could be mixed with a good forever, say, a century after you die. 
So if we can't use Locke's labor mixing theory of property, uh, what sort of theory should we use instead? Well, he says, uh, he says that when somebody takes possession of something and works on it, uh, or maintains it, uh, or uses it in their life, he says, it's in effect a part of her life, a pivotal point in her thinking, planning, and action. Uh, so the thought is, we make things our property, and we respect the property rights of others, because they play this pivotal role in thinking, planning, and action. Uh, so the rationale for property rights is that if somebody else takes or seizes my goods, then that's going to create problems in my life, right? It's going to make it harder for me to think, plan, and act. Uh, so just to flag this point, this is a very similar point to the point uh, made by David Hume in his theory of property. Uh, now we looked at Hume's theory of justice briefly earlier in the semester, where Hume pointed out that when we talk about justice, we're talking about mutually useful rules for living. So the thought is, we have mutually useful rules uh, for dividing up material goods that helps us to think, plan, and act. So if anything, uh, Waldron's theory of property is more similar to Hume's than it is to Locke's. Uh, now, Waldron thinks that if you take this view that property rights are a thing and they make sense because of the role that your material goods play in your thinking, planning, and acting, he says it's going to make it harder to make claims of reparations uh, the further back in time you go. So the less you're using something, the less it is part of your life, and the less it's going to be a pivotal point in your thinking, planning, and acting. Uh, so uh, the longer you are apart from your property, uh, the less plausible you'll be able to appeal to what Waldron says is the main rationale for property rights. Now, he does point out that maybe you might have a claim to a certain item of property, even after hundreds of years, uh, say with sacred grounds, like a, a burial ground, that uh, that's going to be pivotal to the thinking, planning, and action of a particular cultural group, even if they've been dispossessed of it for a very long time. Uh, but when it comes to a piece of land that you need for sustenance, if you've been dispossessed of that land for several hundreds of years, uh, Waldron thinks, well, then it's much harder to make this claim uh, that this thing is actually central to your thinking, planning, and action, that you actually need it for sustenance if you've been getting your sustenance elsewhere for such a long time. So remember, this is a way of filling in Waldron's claim that entitlements are things that can fade over time. Waldron also points out to us that changes in background conditions uh, might make our property rights uh, different. So he says, our level of concern for the rights of others depends on how much our actions will exclude or affect others. Uh, so Remember, rights also come with obligations, right? Uh, if you have certain rights, uh, in many, many cases, that means that that will place obligations on others. So we might think that uh, when circumstances change, uh, that might change the rights for some and the obligations for others. So Waldron's example, and I think that this is a good one, uh, our concern and our obligations to the homeless uh, vary when the weather changes. So you might have more of an obligation uh, to provide shelter for the homeless uh, when the temperature uh, gets down around zero, right? Uh, so here's a point that both Locke and Hume and 
Waldron agree on. It's that if resources are extremely plentiful, uh, then taking that resource for yourself does not harm others. Uh, but if circumstances change, our rights to take and hold goods uh, might be restrained or loosened, right? Uh, so Hume gives a wonderful example that during a famine, for instance, uh, the citizens might have a right to break open the granaries because it's their only way to feed themselves. So uh, we might think that uh, our right to hold on to goods just for ourselves, which farmers usually have, uh, in times of famine, granaries might be busted open. Uh, you know, we might also wonder if property rights uh, change in times of great turmoil like we're going through now, uh, as in this coronavirus pandemic. Uh, we might think that uh, citizens, if scarcity uh, becomes so great, uh, they might have a right to seize the basic means of life, whether that be uh, shelter. Uh, I've heard stories about uh, people seizing unoccupied houses uh, in these times, uh, but also maybe seizing things like food or toilet paper or hand sanitizer or ventilators. So if circumstances change, things get really dire, uh, our rights to keep goods might lessen. So uh, in that sense, our rights of appropriation might be circumstantially sensitive. Uh, so snatching an already appropriated object might be sometimes appropriate. So take Hume's example of busting the granaries open uh, in a time of famine. So uh, a legitimate acquisition in one circumstance may not be legitimate in another set of circumstances, Waldron says. An act which counted as an injustice when it was committed may be transformed into a just situation if circumstances change. So here's a long quote. Uh, here's the case that Waldron wants us to think about. Suppose as before that in circumstances of plenty, various groups on the savannah are legitimately in possession of their respective water holes. So, you know, group A has their water hole, group B has their water hole, group C has theirs. Okay. Now, one day, Motivated purely by greed, members of group Q descend on the water hole possessed by group P and insist on sharing that with them. What's more, they don't allow reciprocity. So they don't allow members of P uh, to share any water hole that was legitimately uh, in the possession of Q. That's an injustice, Waldron says. So if Q comes and barges in on P's watering hole and says, we're going to start taking this from you now. Uh, you don't get to take any of our stuff. Uh, that would be an injustice. Waldron then goes on. But then circumstances change and all the water holes of the territory dry up except the one that originally belonged to P. The members of group Q are already sharing that water hole on the basis of their earlier incursion. But now that circumstances have changed, they are entitled to share the water hole because now everybody gets to use this one remaining water hole, right? So that they're doing so no longer counts as an injustice. It is in fact part of what justice requires, that everybody be given access to this uh, thing that they need. So the injustice of Q against P has been superseded by circumstances. So supersession is just a word that means kind of like overridden or canceled. So what used to be an injustice no longer counts as an injustice. So Waldron goes on, I do not think that this possibility of the supersession of past injustice can be denied except at the cost of making one's theory of historical entitlement utterly impervious to variations in the circumstance in which holdings are acquired. Uh, so Waldron's thought here is that uh, 
you would have an implausible theory of justice and acquisition if you didn't allow for this point that your property rights uh, may loosen or modify when you have a change in circumstance, uh, as we have in this case of the hypothetical watering holes. So now we should think about how this idea of supersession of injustice uh, might apply to questions about reparation. Uh, so he points out that there have been big changes in circumstance in North America and Australasia since these lands were unjustly appropriated from indigenous people. Uh, one thing that Waldron points out is most of the descendants of the colonists, unlike their ancestors, have nowhere else to go. Uh, so it's not like we could just empty out North America uh, and give it back to indigenous tribes at this point, right? Uh, because uh, there's nowhere to go uh, for uh, many U.S. citizens who are not uh, descendants of indigenous uh, groups. So Waldron points out that claims about historic injustice predicated on the status quo ante, that is, the way things were before, may be superseded by a determination to distribute the resources of the world in a way that's fair to all of its existing inhabitants. And he points out, my thesis is not intended as a defense of complacency or inactivity. So there may well be many things that we need to do in order to address the injustices done to indigenous people. Uh, but he thinks that if we really try to come up with a solution to past wrongs that's responsive to all existing inhabitants of the world or of a country, uh, the argument for complete reparations uh, is not feasible or morally required. So to sum up, uh, Waldron is not arguing that expropriating lands from indigenous peoples is just or it's morally okay. Uh, Waldron is clear, it's definitely not okay. Uh, it is a horrifying thing that indigenous people had lands expropriated from them, uh, that they were victims of injustice, um, and that a lot of their, uh, those injustices uh, persist into uh, present day with uh, the inequality that indigenous populations continue to face. Uh, but uh, here's just a final quote that kind of sums up Waldron's view. Behind the thesis of supersession lies a determination to focus upon present and prospective costs, the suffering and deprivation over which we still have some control. So we have some control in this forward-looking sense. So remember, justice is mainly a forward-looking concept for Waldron. So he goes on, the idea that any conception of justice, which is to be made practically relevant for the way we act now, must be a scheme that takes into account modern circumstances and the way those affect the conditions under which people presently live their lives. Uh, so Waldron is basically saying when we think about rights, justice, and reparation, uh, it's not only legitimate, but it's, it's very important uh, to be mindful of how these policies, once enacted, uh, will actually affect people in the here and now. So this gets us to a nice uh, contrast that we can finish up with. Uh, and it's this point uh, that this is basically the opposite view from the one that we saw in Corlett's essay earlier in the week. So you'll remember that J. Angelo Corlett said, look, uh, the injustices done to Native Americans in his case, whereas Waldron is talking about uh, in people indigenous to Australasia, but uh, 
we can see two different ways of thinking about the issue in general, right? Because Corlett said, it doesn't matter how much it hurts to do justice. Uh, we must do justice. Uh, to do anything less than repair these harms completely uh, would be an insult to indigenous populations. But uh, on the other hand, Waldron has now told us that uh, some entitlements to seek justice and reparation might fade over time, and that we should take into consideration uh, the amount of social harm that might come along with carrying out reparation. So this is a hard question, uh, and it's not one that I can settle for you uh, decisively. It's something that you're going to have to think about and settle for yourself. Um, so I will uh, look forward uh, to hearing what you have to say about this on the course website in the discussion boards. Uh, I also uh, suggest that maybe you might uh, write your term paper on this debate between uh, Waldron and Corlett, how we might think about uh, what our justice, what justice requires of us uh, in terms of addressing the past and whether uh, considerations of social harm uh, might uh, attenuate uh, our duties to reparation. So we'll leave it there. Thank you for listening in. And uh, until next time, take care. Thanks.